if we see that some of our leaders are making a mistake and we are juniors what do we do at that time a lot depends on specifics what kind of mistake it is uh, what is our position related what is our relationship with them what is uh, likely to be the consequence of that mistake as compared to the consequence of what we are going to do we see this in the uh, for example in the mahabharat when bhima is first poisoned by duryodhan so at that time uh, he survives by a miraculous arrangement he is thrown into the water but the is a whole story we won't go into that but he survives and comes back now when he comes back he is furious and he wants to hit out at duryodhan and yudhishthir says no he says we are just coming to this kingdom we don't even know who is actually favorable to us who is unfavorable to us and uh, we don't want to create a whole dissension in the whole community and bhishma although he is very kind but he is bound by vow to the ruling king so he says let's keep quiet and be more cautious now bhima just can't i just say they try to kill me how can you just stay silent stay silent about that now you dishter takes this decision but if he uses it by nature although he is a shalsa kshatriya he by nature is a person who tries to resolve things as peacefully as possible mm. but then things seem to go worse and eventually what happens is that they try to have them all burnt alive in varnavat and this time they have to flee and escape because there are too many life attempts they they don't just emerge back but then they wait in the forest what happens there they go to dropadi swayamvar and they get then their alliance is formed with drop dropada now now they are not just orphan boys against the ruling king of kuru now they are the son 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 law of another powerful kingdom and those who had gone out you know and apparently had died apparently they come back victorious and they welcome and dhritarashtra gives them a kingdom back at that time so the point is that was what yudhishthir did at that time a mistake we you said bhima could have felt that it was a mistake but in the long run you could say that it was a success because they were allied with a powerful kingdom and that you could also say it was a mistake it was a because duryodhan only became more aggravated maybe duryodhan evil tendency could have been nipped in the bud at that time we don't know life doesn't come with such a clear guarantees of this is right and this is wrong no we just use our best intelligence and do the best that we can so if if there's a particular way to act and somebody is acting in a different way then we have to basically decide whether this is a battle i want to fight there are many things wrong in the world and uh, even in krishna's movement there can be many things which are not right now this is so i'm the first point i made is that sometimes we cannot even be sure whether something is wrong or not because in life it's not so clear what is right what is wrong but let's assume that somebody is doing something wrong but uh, uh then even then whether it is our position to correct it we have to decide that sometimes we may decide this is so important for me that i am going to fight for this sometimes i may decide that you no know, this is this is not good but this is not what i want to be involved in i cannot get involved in this there are there are other more important things which i want to do in my life then we may decide that okay i just live with this but i focus on uh, my service and if in my service i am dedicated then i grow by that and maybe in future krishna will give me the power to set some things right prabhupad saw so so many saw so many things wrong in gaudiya math he spoke out also in one of the vyas puja uh, ceremonies of bhakti sanjay thakur he said that what are we doing we are just running our mathas and uh, uh, 
uh, feeding our bellies, what are we doing for the mission? Relatively speaking, in the Gaudiya Math hierarchy, Prabhupada was a was a grahastha and a junior god brother. Hmm? So many of his god brothers didn't appreciate his speaking like that. Yeah, but they didn't. Uh, he spoke it out, and they didn't listen. And eventually, Prabhupada uh, continued doing what he was doing, and he came to America, and then he made he was empowered to do a lot. So. He couldn't set things right in Gaudiya Math at that time, but then he did something right separately. But when in Iskon only things would sometimes go wrong, Prabhupada would come down heavily on some devotees. No, this, you should not be doing like this. Sometimes you just let them do what they are doing and gradually learn a lesson. So of course Prabhupada is in the position of authority over here. But I give the example Prabhupada in Gaudiya Math. He tried, but when it didn't work, he just moved on. So basically, if something is clearly wrong, uh, then we have to decide whether this is a battle we want to we want to choose. And if we decide this is what I want to fight, then we should we have to do it in a very respectful way. Mm. This is a technical subject, but I'll just give that quickly as an example. In our tradition, the first major commentary in the Bhagavatam which we have is by Sridhar Swami and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu very much respected the commentary of Sridhar Swami but Sridhar Swami in his commentary has on several places given impersonalistic interpretations and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said that Bhagavatam is our primary book Bhagavatam is uh, the ripened fruit of the Vedic literature and Bhagavatam itself says that and as in Goswami, Sridhar Swami's commentary is the authoritative commentary. Now, what do you do? Bhagavatam is an authoritative book and the authoritative commentary is impersonalistic. Not everywhere, but some places. Now, Sridhar Swami was a very, very exalted devotee, but he sort of He was officially affiliated with the impersonalistic sampradaya, Advaitavad, and he brought bhakti into Advaitavad from inside. Like there is Advaita sampradaya and there is bhakti sampradaya. They are two opposite. But, the, but he was inside, nominally or officially was affiliated with the Advaita sampradaya. So he had to give some Advaitic interpretations. But for the Advaitins also, he showed, actually this Bhagavatam is bhakti. So he had a particular purpose when he did it that way. But Jiva Goswami had another purpose. So Jiva Goswami, while explaining the Bhagavatam, has to explain many places which is not just different from, but opposite to what Sridhar Swami is saying. So how does he do it? Whenever he can. If Sridhar Swami has given a devotional commentary, he quotes Sridhar Swami. And he treats Sridhar Swami like the authoritative commentary. He says, Bhashya Iti. And Bhashya means by default it is the Bhashya. At that time the Bhashya was a Sridhar Swami. But whenever Sridhar Swami has given some impersonalistic interpretation, so he doesn't mention Sridhar Swami by name. He says, according to an imaginary interpretation, it is said like this. But this is the problem. This is this and this is how it should be. This is the right understanding. So what he does is, he does not personally name and target Sridhar Swami. So that is the way he is respectful. He quotes him when he is right and he avoids the name when he is wrong or when, uh, when he is giving a uh, giving an impersonalistic interpretation. So similarly, uh, if we are going to uh, challenge something which the senior is doing, we have to be respectful. Mm? We shouldn't be dismissive and respectfully we can express a different opinion and see how things go. Sometimes, if we do it respectfully, it may be that they also understand, yeah, this is right. And they may change. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? You had a question, no problem, yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, normally, the people, many times, they ask, like, um, you know. Okay, I got, I remember the question, I remember the question. So, um, if we go to hell, or if we suffer for our bad karma, we don't remember it. Then what is the use of 
that suffering yeah it's a yeah you can repeat in hell people suffer but then when we take this but we forget all everything about that so many times we are challenged on that point so what do we ask that? Mm. yeah so the purpose of the material world ultimately is spiritual evolution to help the soul learn to grow toward krishna to love krishna and to ultimately attain krishna and everything within the world is meant for that purpose so even the law of karma is meant for prompting the soul to turn toward krishna although the law of karma we say it is a law of cause and effect it is a law of actions and reactions but the point of the law of karma is not vindictive vindictive means you know you did this so you suffer this it's the point of the law of karma is educative and it's the education is not so much about specifics see the specifics have been told broad in broad principle in scripture and if you do this this will happen if you do this this will happen broadly but real life is complicated it is when we get a particular reaction some reactions uh normally we say action a leads to reaction b that's a oh, that's a very simplified understanding of karma sometimes action a might lead to a series of reactions b c d e f g h i j k so many things can come because of one action conversely a reaction d might be because of action c or reaction d might be a combined reaction for a b c all actions so one action can lead to many reactions one reaction can be the result of many actions in real life things are complicated so if somebody gets a lifelong disease which is incurable now is that for one particular karma that they have done or it's, it's going to stay lifelong we don't know it's complicated so if we start looking for you know why something happened okay this suffering came upon me because of this it's it's so complex we will get lost in the past it's because at every moment something is happening say if i walking along i slip and fall now should i know why i slip and fell then you know if we start thinking about which action led to which reaction or then at what level do we stop at what level we do we stop thinking about okay this let me just move on you know i am driving on the road and i get a lot of traffic today is it because of my past karma is it because of my present karma only i chose to go at a time when i'm traveling when it's crowded mm-hmm. so it's complex so if you start getting gahana karmano gati as the bhagavatam says bhagavata says rather so it's very difficult for us to know and it doesn't it will just get co- us caught in technicalities mm-hmm. in our in uh, specifics where the ultimate purpose is not so much that you, know, you have got this suffering because of this karma the ultimate purpose is to basically get the soul to evolve in consciousness toward krishna mm. and that purpose the principle of karma serves in a generic way so when the soul goes to hell and returns or the soul goes to hell is suffering and returns which and comes out so there is much that is impressed at a subconscious level all of us have a sense of conscience the specifics of their conscience may vary but all of us understand that you know, there are some things which we'll just not do and it's not to be done these things yeah i'll do these things i should not do but maybe i'll do it if i am pressured but this is unacceptable out of question so we have where do we get that from it's not just from our culture or our upbringing it also comes from our previous lives so you could say that the prince that the purpose of suffering is A reorientation it is not just it is not education of particular cause of the suffering that reorientation happens 
not necessarily through recollection of specific the core human specific rights and wrongs but rather assimilation about the, uh, like uh, or rather assimilation about assimilating the nature of reality so suffering so even pleasure what purpose does it serve it's it's very it's very difficult to be discreet about these things even in day to day life if if, if somebody falls sick did they feel so, uh, fall sick because their immunity is low did they fall sick because the weather was bad did they fall sick because they ate something inappropriate did they fall sick because they were with somebody who was infected and they got an infection it could be a b c d or it could be a b and c and d we don't know so usually doctors we try to analyze the cause to some extent but you know when we are analyzing the cause the focus is on taking the treatment we start getting into specifics how do you know why did i get this why did i get malaria oh mosquito but where did the mosquito bite me where did it bite me you can't know the specifics so we shouldn't uh, uh, it's difficult to expect uh, the way we way we function in the world some things we understand cause effect in specifics some things we don't understand and that applies to karma the principle of karma and the suffering because of that also okay okay any other questions okay so let's move on to the third part so till now i discussed about the ramayana and they have come till anga ang because of angad's incidental speech they have now come to the banks of they have come to know that sita is there and all the monkeys they charge rush towards the ocean delighted oh we are going now where sita is and they jumping in joy and they come to the coast of ocean and then suddenly they look at the vast ocean and they fall silent and they start looking at each other we know where sita is but how are we going to get there how do we get across the ocean and they realize this is unscalable so at that time as they all waiting they think what do i do now and they start talking with each other anga that tries to again boost the spirits angad is the leader still and uh, he has somehow it seemed that the day was lost but he he saved the day his is accidental word saved the day so he still feels such like he says i'm sure many of you will be able to jump across the ocean oh monkeys please speak how far can you jump and they all start speaking and none of them can jump as far uh, as geographical specifics are not important but the principle is that they are not able to jump across now here is a very significant point that all the monkeys are they, they are servants of ram they all want to serve ram they all have a sincere desire not only they have a desire but they have been instructed by ram ultimately to go on this mission but still not all of them have equal abilities just because somebody is devoted or somebody is instructed doesn't necessarily automatically mean that everybody will be equally empower, empowered and the monkeys here the vanaras have the honesty to admit their limitations sincerity is not always a substitute for ability hmm? sincerity is not always a substitute for ability certain things require certain abilities and if you don't have that say somebody is not good at 
handling finances and they decided we're going to do a we are going to build a big temple for krishna and then you know, they get get finances but they don't handle it properly and you may lose the money just because we are serving krishna doesn't mean that we are automatically qualified to do every service for krishna so sincerity is of course important and krishna is bhava grahi krishna sees uh, the sincerity of our intent in terms of how eagerly we want to serve him but that doesn't mean that we will be able to do anything and everything there are certain things which we can do certain things which we can't do now it's possible we may say krishna can empower us to do anything yes but krishna empowers by his plan not our plan that means we may say oh prabhupada is just one person and he was so empowered that he preached all over the world yes that is true prabhupada was extraordinarily empowered but he was empowered by krishna's time plan and for you could say now can i just can we say that that means for if prabhupada was empowered why was his preaching not successful in india from 1921 to 1965 practically in 22 for more than 40 years there was not much happening so even a pure devotee like prabhupad he was empowered by krishna's plan so now if we find out that certain service is required and we don't have the ability for it what do we do it is that it requires humility to admit our inability mm-hmm. many times people just you know brag about their abilities especially in today's competitive world when people have to promote everybody has to promote themselves you know so then one of my friends was in iim and he said that one of the major you know i am you know, as a topic top management institute in india he said that we learn a major part of it is how to make your cv as attractive as possible so what are these says if you are walking along a road and you see a tap is on and you switch off the tap so you can write that i am an i am an environmental activist conserving water on the planet <laughs> 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 hmm so um, sometimes in today's competitive world we might feel i i have to i have to promote myself and yes we don't we need to have a proper presenting ability but if we pretend to have the ability that we don't have say i talked earlier about a hierarchy hierarchy is which are based simply on on privilege or uh, genealogy or wealth this can be exploitative but a hierarchy that is based on competence that is desirable where somebody who can somebody who wants to get to the top of the hierarchy but they don't have the ability that is required at the top of the hierarchy and all that will happen is they will hurt themselves and they will hurt everybody else in that hierarchy also. so if one of the monkeys who had said who couldn't jump across the ocean that monkey said i want to jump across the ocean and he would have gone and he would have probably fallen the ocean and perished and even if he had not perished somehow he had survived and come back all the other monkeys would have been waiting they would have lost they would have uh, lost time they would have lost so much um, of uh, maybe lost somebody who lost life at his risk life so you know if we don't have the ability to be at the top of the hierarchy that doesn't mean that we are useless we all have our opportunities where we can do some services but an aspect of bhakti is at one level we have faith that krishna can empower anyone to do extraordinary things but to think that i am empowered or think i will be empowered you know, that might be presumptuous so we have to both be open to krishna's krishna's potential to empower us 
we can't say, I, I will never be able to do this. No, we might be able to do tomorrow. But if we can't do something right now, acknowledging it is important. When we acknowledge it, then we can work to fix it as it is required. Uh, so now, when the monkeys spoke like this, at that time, Angad said that I, I could conceivably jump across, but that will drain me so much that I won't have the energy to leap back again. Jambavan said that when I was young, I could have jumped across the whole earth, but now I can't. So as they were thinking like this, there was one person who was silent. Who was that? Hanuman. <laughs> so Hanuman, he is silent and then Jambavan turned towards him and he says, Oh Hanuman, why are you silent? Hanuman, it was almost like you know, this is out of question for me. So he was not even speaking his voice. But then Jambavan, he started speaking about the glories of Hanuman. He, Hanuman had been cursed with forgetfulness, but it was like a, not a permanent forgetfulness. It was, you see, the point was that he had ability, he had powers, but at that time he was abusing the powers. He was, as a small mischievous child, he was, uh, he was uh, troubling the sages. Sometimes he would take all the sacred paraphernalia and just carry it away. Sometimes he would uh, extinguish their yajna. Sometimes he would just basically do all kinds of mischievous things. And because he had these mystic powers, so nobody could catch him also. And then the sages told, uh, sages told his parents, but you know, sometimes he was he had so much young, some, so much childish, impetuous energy that even his parents couldn't do anything. And in a sense, Hanum, that energy was so much. See, there is, uh, children always have energy, but if you give them power that is disproportionate to the energy, then if a child is given like an automatic machine gun, hey, that's dangerous. The child may not intend to harm anyone, but you know, they don't have the maturity to understand. And therefore, that power at that age with him was not wise. So they took away the power from him. And they said that when somebody reminds you of this power, for a cause bigger than yourself, then you will remember. Then you will come back and will gain this power back. So Jambavan started glorifying. And as you started glorifying Ra, glorifying Hanuman, slowly but surely, what happened? Hanuman's memory started coming. And as his memory started coming, it was, his confidence started coming back. And his confidence started manifesting in terms of his increased physical size. Jambavan was speaking to him and Hanuman and Jambavan were the same height. But as Jambavan started glorifying Hanuman, Hanuman started becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And Jambavan became more and more jubilant on seeing Hanuman becoming bigger and bigger. It's like you're talking with someone and you look up and up and up and up. <laughs> hey, what happened? <laughs> so he started becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And then Hanuman spoke in a thunderous voice. He said, yes, I will jump across the ocean. I will find Sita and I'll come back. And Hanuman ran and leapt up to a nearby small hill and then he poised and he leapt into the sky and as he leapt into the sky the, by the pressure of his the, the hill just moved back and trees flew out of the hill the pressure was so great and Hanuman leapt into the sky and as Hanuman marched like a missile through the sky it flew like that all the monkeys cheered the monkeys as they were flying as they saw Hanuman flying he says our best wishes and prayers for your well-being. And he said, we can't help you. We can't be there with you, but we will be praying for you. And then Angad said, and all of us will perform tapasya to give 
the credits of that pious austerity to do you. What are the austerity? They said they will stand in yogic posture on one foot with their hands upraised, praying. That is like asan. They said we'll stand like this for as long as you are back, as long as you are away. When you come back, till that time we'll be performing this austerity. So they couldn't be the lead players, but that doesn't mean that they said. Okay, you do everything, we'll relax. They were in their own way offering their good wishes, the, the results of their mystic, mystic austerities to Hanuman. So Hanuman, he later on, so Hanuman, the whole story of Hanuman going on to Lanka and finding Sita is itself a big adventure, but without going into the specifics of that, we'll focus on the team spirit. So, now when Hanuman comes back, he tells us what he has achieved is stupendous, alone going into the enemy kingdom and not only finding Sita, he finds Sita and then he decides that, let me do some more service. So he decides he wants to give a warning to Ravan and he also decides that let me do some reconnaissance to find out how what the military formations in Lanka are and thus, he starts disrupting the garden in which Sita is there and then he is able to finally go before Lanka, before Lanka's king Ravan, give him a stern warning and then he sets half of Lanka on fire and he comes back. Now when he comes back at that time, uh, he is just roaring in joy, in exultation, he is flying back and the Vanaras who are waiting for him, they hear him before they see him. And they are all jubilant, but just by the sound, they, you know, if somebody is speaking itself in a very cheerful tone, you know, wherever they had gone, it must have been successful. So they become happy just by hearing that. And then Hanuman descends and they all surround him and tells his whole story and this is. When they hear finally, how, what all he has done, they are stunned, they are delighted. But when they hear that Sita has only uh, two months remaining, Ravan has given her uh, one year period. He says, if you don't give yourself to me, then I will, I am going to take you. He says, I am going to have you. If you don't give yourself to me, then I will have my Rakshasis cook you and you will be my breakfast. So, he is a, he's a demon, he is a Rakshasis, a cannibal. When they hear the Sita is in great danger, the Vanara say, oh, we need to go back immediately and they all rush back. Now when they rush back, at that time they are also delighted that when they return to Sugriv, there are many incidents in between, also a few incidents in between, but they return to Sugriv, it is Sugriv who is told, Angad tells, we have found Sita, we got information and Angad is, so we are so delighted, Sugriv. So it's Angad who gives the first information because he's the team leader. But then when they say let's go to Ram and then Ram tells Ram asks what happened and then Hanuman tells the whole story and when Hanuman tells the whole story Ram is first astonished then distressed to hear about Sita being afflicted and then again delighted to hear about Hanuman's chastising Ravan and burning Lanka and finally in uh, Ram, when Hanuman completed the whole story, Ram says that, Oh Hanuman, you, know, you have done such an extraordinary service for me. What can I offer you in return? He says, I, I have nothing. I am I'm in the forest, I have nothing. Therefore, he says, I will offer you myself. And he invites you embrace and Hanuman, many of you may see this picture of Ram embracing Hanuman. So there, and Hanuman receives that embrace. It is Hanuman is embraced, but through that all the manas are also blessed. Hanuman does the outstanding service, but ultimately they are all successful. And when Ram embraces Hanuman, it is for Hanuman that is the perfection of his life. To be and to be blessed by the Lord in that way. A Sri Vaishnava commentator 
on the ramayana says that actually uh, that ram is the same as narayan and on narayan's body lakshmi resides so when hanuman embraces sorry hanuman is embraced by narayan and then that narayan who is the supreme wealth in the universe who is adorned by the source of all the wealth in the universe by the goddess of fortune that lord he embraces him that means that actually hanuman becomes supremely enriched by that hanuman gets the supreme wealth because the ultimate attraction in the world is the all attractive supreme and that we want to get attracted to the supreme but if somebody does a service by which the supreme becomes attracted there is no greater attainment than that and that is the culmination because so this is the mission on which this team had gone is a stupendous success for all of this not only sita found not only is ravan bond not only is ravan given a demonstration of ram's power but also r- those who have gone on this mission especially hanuman who has been spectacularly successful he is personally and profoundly blessed by ram so this is the success of this team you could say it's a team of monkeys but it's a team of those who are devoted to ram and they are not ordinary monkeys they are great devotees although they are in vanara bodies but they work together and achieve this success in their service of ram so to summarize i spoke on stream of teamwork in the ramayana started by talking about how every team requires a hierarchy you no know, we live in a age of egalitarianism where we like equality but to do anything in life some people are better to do doing it than others so if a hierarchy functioning hierarchy is formed then those who are good at it are best to best position at the top of that hierarchy so when any hierarchy is there a team involves equality because every member is there in the team and every member has to be valued but at the same time for the team to ta- take a particular task there has to be a hierarchy so how that hierarchy is used to serve the purpose that is what we discuss so i talked about there are nat- there may be how hanuman emerges as a natural leader so there is a appointed leader and there is a emergent leader so the appointed leader is angad because he is the royal prince but although he is young he tries his best to lead the team and he discussed about how the hierarchy is formed based on any purpose other than competence and then it often it becomes exploitative it can become tyrannical but if competence is not recognized and hierarchy is rejected because of that then we will have chaos we can even have disaster we can't have equality between the pilot and the passengers the plane will crash then we the pilot is is the lead over there so i talked about how the left and the right need to be in dialogue the left wants to flatten hierarchies because hierarchy they say become exploitative the right wants to maintain hierarchy because hierarchy leads to productivity gets things done so now sometimes the hierarchy is exploitative and the left is right and things have to be adjusted and sometimes the right is right and a uh, hierarchy has to be maintained if we have to get things done so it's only when there's a discussion that things can move forward and then i talked about the first challenge was that when they were starving they came into the they went in the cave where of anuman emerged as a natural leader by his speaking ability so he ensured that the vanaras didn't pounce on the fruits when they saw it but he waited and pleased swayam prabha with his words and then they were able to eat without any harm and then because of the mystic arrangement of the cave they couldn't come out then hanuman persuaded swayam prabha about the sincerity of his purpose and then she not only took them out but brought them out further south so closer to their goal so there so both temptation and tribulation can be obstacles on the spiritual path on any path we are pursuing then we need to persevere through both and hanuman leads them both through that 
leads them through both of these. Then eventually they are searching and they can't find and they become discouraged, a month is over. So Angad especially is his first assignment and he is, he is failed so he becomes demoralized. He starts casting aspersions on Sugriva and he has this residual resentment because his father has been killed because of Sugriva. So at that time Hanuman doesn't openly threaten or criticize Sugriva. How dare you, sorry, th criticize Angada. Say, he doesn't say, how dare you speak like this about Sugriva. But he tries to gently persuade Angada. There's a problem and Angada is so disheartened that he says that I'm going to fast to death. And Hanuman is remembering the Lord, trying to mm, resolve the issue at that time. Help comes in an unexpected way, in the form of a bigger problem. So if we if sometimes we are not able to do a service, but if we maintain our service attitude, Krishna will give us a way ahead. So circumstantially, Sampati comes over there and Angada speaks, oh, our fate is going to be like Jatayu. And that's how the Sampati reveals his identity, relationship with Jatayu, and then Sampati reveals where Sita is across Lanka. So rather than losing hope when things are not working out, if we just keep doing what we can, Krishna can open doors if we just maintain the service attitude. And then we talked about how the Vanaras couldn't actually jump across. Although they were instructed by the Lord, although they were devoted, although they were eager to serve, but still sincerity is not always a substitute for ability. So they, humility means to acknowledge one's inability. They acknowledged it and then they couldn't move ahead and then they allowed then that's how this, the focus shifted to Hanuman and Hanuman was reminded by Jambavan and that's how Hanuman came into his own assumed a large form and jumped across Lanka and then eventually when Hanuman came back and revealed the whole story to Ram Ram blessed him by his personal embrace and he who is the supreme shelter of the supreme treasure of the universe gave himself to Hanuman and thus their mission was supremely successful. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So any questions? Sometimes in Krishna consciousness we might find ourselves in a position of leadership in a field that we don't feel ourselves confident or we don't feel ourselves uh, good at. Hmm. Mm. So what do you <laughs> So if we are made leaders in a field where we are not comp good at, what do we do? Yeah, it's good to admit our inability, but sometimes uh, uh, it's like we don't have an option between a good choice and a bad choice. The only option is between a bad choice and a worse choice. <laughs> so what do you do at that time? <laughs> so if many times we have a severe shortage of devotees and in the situation we might be the only person available. You know, Prabhupada, when the mm, when the Juhu land controversy was going on, at that time, he, the devotees were going to they were being threatened by the person who was selling the land, Mr. N. And the devotees were getting uh, intimidated by him. So they were thinking that, he said that, they were thinking of just cancelling the whole contract. And Prabhupada, Prabhupada was not a person who talked much on phone. Hmm? So Prabhupada, Send Vishakha Mataji at that time. He said, You go. And Prabhupada wrote a strongly worded letter. And he said that you go and personally deliver this. So he did that, but by that time it was too late. And the the devotees already cancelled the deal. And Prabhupada was furious. He says, Who gave who told you to cancel the deal? Why did you do that? At that time, the devotees, some of the devotees who were involved in their whole project, they become so disheartened. So they said, Prabhupada, we resign. So 
Prabhupada said, why are you resigning? He said, I don't want you to resign. He says, you made a mistake. But that doesn't mean I don't want you to do the service. So Prabhupada uh, was angry with them for the mistake that they had committed. But that does not mean that he didn't have trust in, uh, trust in them or he didn't want them to be leaders. So now at that time, if you see, it was very difficult for them. They were probably in their 20s and they were in a foreign land. And Indians always think that anybody from the West has a lot of money. In fact, Indians think that if Indians have gone to the West, they also want a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And now, it may be true, it may not be true. The devotee is, they were, they were being taken for a ride. And they were, it, you could say that they were not the most competent people for that. But there was no one else. So they had to, to take up the leadership and they did that. And uh, we see the Krishna Conscious Movement is quite vibrant in India also now. So if we have to take up a service, which we are not good at, and then we can express our inability, express our, uh, uh, our feelings of inadequacy for that service. But if you are told to do that, then we move, we do our best and move on. And sometimes we may need more regular guidance then from somebody who is expert. Sometimes if you have to take up a service which you are not good at, we might not take it in a big way. We can start in a small way, so that even if something goes wrong, it's not not a big negative result. It's um, there are different contexts. If it's a mm, service where nobody is there and the service has to be done, then we move forward and do it. But usually those are services which are uh, often things which we do learn. It are the services which we have are not life and death situations. It's not like we are going to war, if we don't know weapon will be killed. It's not literally like that. So if we can't do something, we learn from it. And we either do it ourselves or maybe Krishna sends somebody else after some time. We see how we move on. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, hmm. that's true. Hmm. If somebody is trying to push themselves up in the position, so it happens sometimes that some devo- some devotees, some people in general, they are a bit too self-promotional. Hmm. So it's always good to give people benefit of doubt. That means rather than thinking that this self-promotion is because of ego, we could say that they have a service attitude and they they want to do more service and if they have more position, they can do more service. So we don't want to be naive, but we don't have to be hypercritical also. So if that is not, if their self-promotion is not really hurting anyone or harming anyone, then we could just give them the benefit of doubt. Yeah, maybe they just want to serve more. And if they are given more more facility, they can do more service. That's what their longing is. Um, that is, if uh, what they are doing is not hurting anyone. Just that they keep speaking that. And, and everybody also uh, learns this is how this person is. And we live with that. But sometimes, in trying to promote oneself, people start pulling others down. Oh, he doesn't know how to do it. I can do it better. She doesn't know how to do it. I'll do it much better. And then they start pointing out all this wrong, this is wrong, that is wrong, that is wrong. Then you have to be a little careful about it. We don't want to start gossip and backbiting and criticism. You know, gossip, when does it happen? It happens when we hear something we like about someone we don't like. (laughs) When we hear something we like about someone we don't like, oh really? I'm going to tell everyone about this now. <laughs> it becomes like that. So we don't want to have that kind of backbiting starting in our moment. Mm. So if they are pulling, if they are pushing themselves up, that's just, mm, we can give them the benefit of doubt. 
but in pushing themselves up, they start pulling someone else down. Then we may have to take a stand over there. Right? They are doing. Uh, you know, don't criticize others. And uh, sometimes some people just have to learn by experience. You know, that they push themselves up. They try to do some service which they uh, they are not qualified by the thought. They are not qualified for, but they think they are qualified for. And then they they, they crash. And then they learn. So. Sometimes it might just be that somebody doesn't know etiquette, so we don't have to be self-promotional like it is in the outside world. And then, if we just tell them as devotees, you know, we don't, you know, we don't promote ourselves like that. We today morning in Chaitanya Charitamrit reading how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu actually places himself as a student of his followers. So, in devotional service. There are times when we can talk about our qualification, but there are times we talk also about our lack of qualification. But it is mercy that qualifies us. So sometimes, if we help people to understand the devotional etiquette, that also helps them to choose more better. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much. Shri Ramachandra Bhagwan ki, Ramayan ki. Shri Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Itai Gaur Premanande. Thank you very much. Please raise your Pancharam Prabhu ki.